the Ontario Genealogical Society. Uh, this is our October meeting, and uh, we're very happy to have you, and we're very happy to have Chris Carter as uh, our presenter later on this evening uh, to the side. Just a bit of information for your benefit, uh, a bit of an introduction here. Uh, something that we have started relatively recently, and that is that we are now live streaming our meetings um, for each, each session uh, so that people, if you're not able to attend in person, uh, you can uh, view the meeting uh, online. This is something which uh, we find is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, and again, I'll just clarify for a moment the reason for part of it is that we have about 100, 150 members about 25% actually live in this area. So uh, this way we can keep the, the people who are members and they can uh, keep up to date with what's going on within the branch itself. So that's really the reason for it. Uh, and it's probably very popular too. Just some background information again for you. Uh, we are associated with the a branch of the Ontario Genealogical Society, and as such, we uh, we have involvement with the provincial, as well as access and involvement with other branches across the uh, across the province. If you need to make use of the internet to get information, here are the two websites that you can get. The provincial one at the top, and a slight adjustment to that with the word Essex, or our branch website. So we are also on Facebook. We're very modern. We hope that those various opportunities will uh, uh, will be beneficial to you. Last month, we were very fortunate to, as it says, hold our September meeting at the Conver and District Historical Society and Museum. And uh, a good turnout and very positive feedback. It was basically a road trip for the first time. And uh, I think it, I was not able to attend personally, but I heard good comments on it. And I think what it did was give people in, in the county an opportunity to physically be present and involved at, at such a meeting. So uh, I don't know what the executive has planned, but I suspect uh, based on that, there may be future road trips to other parts of, of the county to, to uh, share ideas and speakers. As you know, Chris Carter is our presenter tonight. And a little bit of a plug for Chris. Uh, he is offering uh, throughout the, uh, the school year, if you wish, from October through to May, a series of free lectures on the history of uh, this area, and uh, one a month. And they're offered at the um, uh, Canadian Transportation Museum on our town line. And uh, it will give you a very good, if you look at the, uh, the topics there, a very good variety of information on the history of this County of Windsor area over a period of time. So, if you're a history buff as well, uh, take advantage of the opportunity to uh, take in uh, Chris's, uh, Chris's lectures when you can. And uh, they're suggesting that you call the uh, Transportation Museum in order to register for uh, each or all of the courses. And, uh, and they, as I say, are free. But uh, they'd like to know how many are coming. So if you want to take advantage of that, please do so. Another announcement of a sort of sister-related organization, uh, which the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, as indicated here, is having a 15th anniversary celebration. Uh, Tower of Freedom Underground Railway Monument, uh, October the 20th at the United Way Building, uh, not quite sure where that is. I think it's on Erie Street, but I may be wrong. Uh, but uh, uh, if you're interested in being part of that and attending that 
please feel free to do so. November, next meeting. An intriguing title. Can GPS prove my lineage? And we're very fortunate to have a former regional director of the Genealogical Society, Debbie Honor, uh, to present uh, this particular topic. And uh, I think, again, for those who are just maybe beginning or uh, even the experienced people in with genealogical research will find this very informative. And so, again, mark that on your calendar. We're back to the Monday dates now. Uh, just a little, little bit of a uh, change because of uh, Thanksgiving uh, moving into Tuesday, but it is basically the second Monday of every month. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Tonight, uh, we are very fortunate to have with us Chris Carter. Chris just amazes me, really, with the amount of work he does in terms of history. You just saw a series of lectures. He has books at the back of the uh, auditorium, which he has authored. Uh, he is totally immersed and enthusiastic about the history of Essex County. So uh, whenever you have an opportunity to hear Chris uh, or get some of his books, which are available, uh, tonight, if you're interested in looking at them, and uh, take advantage of it because they're most entertaining and enjoyable reads uh, for uh, for this. So, I'm going to make a switch here uh, to let's see where we are. Okay, and now I need to okay help. Oh. <laughs> Sound like an easy idea at the time. Yeah. How do I get out of the uh, over there? And, uh, and get down here is, is uh, Chris's at the bottom. Second one. Yeah, right there. Oh, the other one. Second one. There we go. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, Chris Carter. You'll, you'll be able to push when you choose yep. those. Oh, okay. for Thanks. There's a chair for you. Thank you. Anyways, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, since uh, we're into the promotion part already, instead of at the end, I, will, I, will, I do want to mention on this series, uh, if you forget the call, show up anyways. All right, they just try and get an estimate of numbers. So if you say, darn, I can't go, I didn't call in advance. Don't worry about it, go. The other thing, they do call the series. People thought last year they had to go to all of them. You don't. There's only one topic you're interested in, just come to that one day. All right? You do not have to come to all of them. You just come to what you're interested in. I don't want to bore you with six of them so you learn about the seventh. The uh, May one says a tour that's real tentative. If we don't get numbers, we're not going to do it. And it's just a, a we'll go on tour, a bit of a recap of some, you know, see some of the places we talk about. I do have my books available at the back. There's a sheet at the back that tells you different books that I carry. I've either published them or written them. You'll be able to tell by the sheet. I, I, and a little plug for uh, AIRS. I'm with the uh, Arrow Early Immigrant Research Society, which works along uh, quite well with the uh, genealogical societies of uh, Ontario. We are a member of that organization as well. And uh, as it says, is a uh, Harrow Early Immigrant Research Society. They do mostly genealogy. Now, I'm, if you say, hey, my ancestor was so-and-so, okay, Tom Smith, born in 1790 to 1850, that's nice. Big deal. That's fine, okay? I don't mean to belittle anybody's ancestors, but big deal. I want to know myself, what did they do? Did they contribute? Were they, and maybe they were just a farmer, but that's okay. They came here, they settled on the land, they actually stayed. And look today, we got a whole room full of their descendants. That's what I'm interested in, is the stories. So when you go to Ayers and, and 
You get all your names and information. If you're interested in any name along the, the new settlement, if you don't go to Ayers, you're really wasting your time. Go there, get what they have. Some of them, and I, I don't have any books up here, but some of those names like Toffelmeyer, like Munger, like Waggle, they can fill this table, the two of them here together, this deep with information. They go on their computer and push go and print out 500 pages of your family history. So now here you're trying to put all this together. Everybody else has done that. I want you to go out there or wherever. If you're French, the French Society is now just off uh, Prince Road there. But if that's your, if that's what you're looking for, please do that first. Get started. There's brochures on your table there for heirs. I've got a few at the back. But get started that way. When I went looking for mine, I wanted to find out about my grandmother who had, and grandfather who had a little store in uh, Harrow for a couple of years. That's what started me there. And it took us three years to figure out that alone. But um, if they can hand you even 10 pages of your family history, that helps you a lot. It also may give you some contacts to talk to that may have some more. Now you take that group and you add and expand what you have, you go back to heirs and share it. Remember, they share it with you. You share with them, now we have a new 100% story. But for me, it's the story, not the names. Names don't mean anything. You know, you go back in your family and maybe you're John Smith the 100 or something. That doesn't mean a thing to me. I like the stories. So we're going to walk through here a little bit. I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the small communities along the, in the southern part of the county and some of the settlers in that. So if we can flip to the first, what happened here to us? There we go. What I want to show you is that most people are familiar with this map. I know it's basic. If you are starting your family history, it's pretty hard not to have at least some kind of addition to this. You've got the Amherstburg Early Settlement here from the 1796. You've got the uh, 1792 settlement here. Sandwich Town isn't on there, but the uh, Petite Coat, mid-1700s, uh, mid about 1754 or so, out of Detroit. As a, it wasn't a suburb, it was just farms. Okay, it wasn't. The farmers there had to get in their little canoes or little barges and go over to Fort Detroit for their mail, all their supplies. They were just farmers on a piece of land, but they were assigned those pieces of land. So they were earlier settlers. Uh, it also doesn't show the, like the, too much of the uh, Detroit River waterfront across from Detroit, but you can see how it's all settled. And um, you can see the many lakes. Some of them are, are gone now. Uh, Giles Boulevard used to be a, a coulee or a marsh or actually a flowing river. It used to come out between Olette Street and the Bobby House downtown. And if you see maps of the Bobby House, like where they actually show you a map or a big picture, not just a picture of the house, you'll see the river coming through there. And water was very important in being on it. Okay, no cars. So we're going to, we're going to continue on, but I want you to understand the, well, we're basically today talking in this area here. All right. Next. I just want to make sure that people are on, we're, we're all on the same uh, path here. I don't know what's going on at the bottom there for your, your mouse. I, want, I always like showing this one. This map was found in, Thomas Smith was uh, a surveyor, early surveyor. And um, this was found in his map, uh, in with his papers of 1803. There is a, a northern half of this as well. I didn't put it in today because we're talking about the southern part. But this is obviously not 1803 because he's already talking about Harris's landing in 1813 and the Battery Point where they, and that's wrong, he landed over here at Battery Point. All right, the Town Reserve, 1792 for the Town of Colchester. So if you quickly do your math, that figures out that next year it's going to be 225 years old. And I'll say it while I'm out here, Colchester, Niagara on the Lake are both 1792. They're the oldest planned towns this side of Kingston. And we know Frontenac started Kingston, right? So he was a little earlier. The oldest two town plans 
in Ontario, this side of Kingston, was Colchester. So the new settlement, which the town was based for the farmers to have a place to do their merchandising, post office, all that stuff, and stores, was, is 225 years old next year. All right, but what I like showing here, and I'm going to do it quickly so we can get on, is uh, this area right here. Count the islands. One, two, three, four. There's four different islands in here, if you count them, that make up the southern part of Amsterdam. Those four islands are still there today, but people don't realize that. All right? Today, you can get in here at Big Creek, right, conservation area, Holly Beach, and you can still canoe and come out here by the Bellevue, Bellevue House, which Amsterdam just bought. You can do that. There's only a problem, you might, I think today you have to take about three portages to do that. But you can still canoe from here to there. And that would have been done a lot. All right? Yes, this is an island. This is your Naps Island. You, this, you can see it. There, the water comes up here, you can see the rivers. Those are rivers. There's only one road, and that's this. And that's not a road, that's just a goat path or an Indian path, if you wish. Enough for a couple wagon wheels, marks. That's about all that is. But what, the other thing that's, um, the other thing that's important is the, uh, again, the relationship to the U.S. Most of our, many of our early settlers were on Gros Seal. Half a dozen years, they had to pay off their ransom to the McComb family and came across. The one I want to point out on here is Road to the Negroes Purchase. That's very important. It's not early, 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 but believe it or not, it is 1824, by 1824. And what happened is when the, when the escaped slaves came, the fugitives came, whether they came to Sandwich Town, whether they came to Amherstburg, they could not stay there. All right? You say, well, yeah, they put a church in those places. When did they put it? 1850s. When, it, when the towns were built up more and it was much safer. They could not stay there when they first came from up to about 18, almost 1850. They had to get inland. In Windsor, and Sandwich area, they put them on what they call the baseline road out by the airport. And you know that the Walls family came very late in that time because they're at the far end of it. They're, they're as far end as baseline goes until it dead ends away from the airport. Right? Baseline sort of kitty corners off it. All right, here. Look where they look at where they got. They actually purchased the land. What they get? This is Harrow, by the way, right downtown Harrow. Right there. Okay? That's Hiram Walker's Marsh, if you wish. You put his train down here, you put a tried cranberry, build uh, growing cranberries there. I don't know, the Indians had grown cranberries here from the like 1600s and had no problem in Anderton. But for some reason, Hiram Walker couldn't get the cranberries to grow. Otherwise, maybe we would have had early cranberry whiskey, flavored whiskey. But anyways, it didn't work for him. But yeah. That's Harold. Today it's called the Matthew Settlement, where the, uh, the black community is. It was called Hope Town in 1824. Harold came very late. Hiram Walker's brought Harold. And um, we'll continue on to the next. But what ha Hiram Walker's train was supposed to go into Colchester Village and then turn to Kingsville. He cut it short. <coughs> Excuse me. He cut it short. It comes into Harold. There was no Harrow. That was a, a couple people's farm, Munger's farm. They grew up to be Munger's Corners. But what happened now is all the people had to move from where they were to the train track. That happens many times, right? This is an older map, about 1885 it says. But I, I wanted to point out some of the um, some of the roads on here and some of the concerns people had. The biggest, biggest problem with Essex County was all that water I showed you in the corner. That was everywhere. 
You weren't on what Highway 3. The old eight, Highway 18, okay, County Road 20. The old Highway 2, which used to be Tecumseh Road, not out where it was at, by the airport when they were calling it Highway 2. Highway 2, if you came in Highway 2, you were at Tecumseh, on Tecumseh Road. All right? Before that, you were at, right at the waterfront. But it didn't come out to the airport until, what, almost, almost 1970, I think. Well, before Highway 2 was heavy coming out by the airport. But anyways, it doesn't matter. It, there was, everywhere else was underwater. If it wasn't, I mean, swamp, swamp land, muck, clay. If you ever put a garden in your backyard, chances are it's clay. So that, that stuff's no good. So where you saw it on the other one, we had settlements all the way around the water. It's the only way to get around it. Okay, over here is Romney Township. There was a little community there named Romney because of the post office they had. They had a church, they had some stores and stuff. And when they, those farmers wanted to mill their products, they had to come down here to mill their products. They couldn't go to McGregor's Mill in Chatham. They couldn't get there. All right? We're talking pre-1850. They couldn't get there. But even this, this is 1885, this map claims to be. Here's Harold. By that time, it was getting going. The train came through in 1881. Here's Harold. Well, where's County Road 20 or Highway 18? To get to Amsburg. It didn't come up. Well, remember the old map? I don't want to pull that up again, but you remember it? All marsh, islands, water. The road ended there. If you wanted to get to Amherstburg, the Amherstburg Road came along here and down here. Today we call it the Pike Road, County Road 18. Okay? You could not, the road didn't go this way like you can today until 1925. That was all, that was swamp. You didn't want to live there. Just think of the mosquitoes. But I wanted to put this in on purpose. Okay, Colchester Point, they call it. You've got Oxley, which is uh, 1850s. Cranfield Dock was for the farmers, built for the farmers at the end of the uh, Arnor Town Line. Was here. Malotte's, or, uh, Malotte's Dock is in Kingsville today. Uh, County Road 50 turns at Malotte's Dock to go up to the beer store. Or if you come from the beer store, that's where it turns to follow the lake. Uh, Kingsville, they're showing here, Ruth, the Ruthven Road, and then you had a little road here called the Graham Side Road. And we'll continue on with another one. Okay, we're into, we're into Colchester now when it was first planned, but the, um, that, like I say, it was a first planned community. Sandwich came the year after, Peter Russell did it, and then Amherstburg came a couple years after that. What I want to show you is the weird and wonderful way they planned it. Every one of these squares is a one acre. So you got a lot, it was one acre. That was the same in Sandwich Town. They were all one acre lots. But every one of these were meant to be for some buildings of the town. So you come in. Uh, County Road 50 would be one right here today. No, it has to be this one. Because we're, no, so, okay, no, I'm sorry, this one is, County Road 50. You've got government's building here. One thing that messed this up was the Silly Cemetery. And we'll see that in a minute, I'll go to it. I'm not going through all this, but I want to show you the, the British idea at the time. You can see back here off the main street was all the, uh, was the public buildings your town halls, that kind of stuff, your schools, all in the area, the houses around, it was central. And uh, we'll continue in a moment because that was the 1792 plan. It didn't, doesn't exactly look like that today. All right, next. Now, I, I just found this map, but Take, take, can everybody see the square, or do you want me to blow it up? I'll blow it up here. 
That should be on angle to one here. There we go. There it goes. Just for a minute. Come on. What I want to show you, can you see that now? Yes. Okay. Every one of those little squares, again, is a square acre. Same kind of stuff. Your town areas. Amherstburg doesn't look like that either. That county, that system of planning did not work here. All right? But that's what I want to show you there. Now, again, this is your early settlement. This is the 1842 plan. The other one didn't work. It didn't really go anywhere. It just wasn't going to happen. As you can see here in the 1842 plan, there's your county road uh, 50. Are we 18A? 18A, not 18. And you'll see the businesses along it just like they are today. So, what messed up that one thing that messed up that other plan, and this one to a point, is a cemetery that's right there. The old Anglican Church Cemetery. When they came by to survey this, they started surveying these lots in about 1885 or 6. Right in that time period, they started surveying this. When they surveyed that that burial ground at the end, at the uh, church in uh, the church in Colchester, was already called an abandoned cemetery at that time. But it's not an Indian native cemetery. We don't know exactly what it was and why it was to be abandoned that early because it's not an Indian one. And in theory, we weren't here yet. But, as theory, and theory only, we have no proof, you didn't, I, but I do know, at night, in a sailboat, you never ever went up the Detroit River. No, no, no. You're, you're sunk. You're hitting something. So, that's the last place to stop before you go up the Detroit River. Maybe some sick people on boats, some sailors that didn't get thrown overboard. I'm not sure. That's all. That's the only thing at the moment that we could attribute to it. You can see the lot numbers along here. What I want to show you here that's pretty neat is you can see the new town plan. It has nothing to do with uh, one acre lots this way. But you can. This, these streets are still here today. All the side. This is perfect today. These They call these park lots. Mr. Johnson still lives on that lot today. His, his uh, grandfather got it about 1850. His grandfather and uh, Eubanks, right here. The two boys, young men, probably in their early 20s, ran away from slavery. They ended up, they were told to take that path. They ended up in uh, Colchester. And everybody there helped him out. Mr. Johnson is still alive today. He's 101. He's still driving, but don't worry. You don't have to get off the road. I'll get in the car with him. He drives to Chatham every month. I have no problem getting in the car with him. There's many 70-year-olds I won't get in the car with, okay? <laughs> now he has to go in October when he turns 102 to get his license renewed. Personally, it wouldn't surprise me if they renew it. Okay? He's all there. He is the grandson of a slave. You, you go to the, you talk to people here, oh, I'm the fifth or sixth or seventh. I mean, I'm even, I, I'm eight generations from the 1792 person that came. Man, he knows a lot. And he's willing to tell you. He's all, he's all there. We've made sure we've gotten it. But where he's uh, up here, in this area, and parts of this, that's where the black community set up in Colchester. This is uh, the old church land. Clergy reserves. It was reserved for the Anglican church. They were squatters on there. Josiah Henson spent seven years there trying to get land in Essex County. It didn't work so well, but he got his land, didn't he? Right? He just had to move a little further. He got 200 acres that he purchased. He ended up buying another 200. So they had 400 acres to make this community 
in uh, Chatham, Kent. While he was here, he was a hero in the Rebellion of 1837. That's a whole other story. What I want to show you here is here's a hero, if you wish. This is the gore. They called that Pot Lake or Pot Lake. There, the school there, there's a lake behind it. It's Pot Lake because it was shaped like a pot. Somebody said, well, there was a Peg Lake guy, and they named it after the Peg Lake guy, but no, it's Pot Lake. And you can see all the businesses were along there. What did I show you up about Harrow, right? It was underwater. You wouldn't be up there. And that was the main road. Remember, the, the Harrow, the road didn't go anywhere. So you either came down here or you took the gore. The gore, the Indian path came through here. The Sock Trail, S-A-U-K. It came from just south of Chicago. I can never remember the little town. It starts with an R. Just south of Chicago, and it ends in Oxley, believe it or not. But the Sauk Indians used to travel there along that trail to get to Fort Malden, get to Matthew Elliott to get their goodies. The thing is, the trail went right through to Oxley. There's still a piece of the trail going through here. There's a couple little pieces of the trail in Amherstburg. One's on the old Botsworth farm. I think his, his driveway is actually a piece of the trail. But it did end in Oxley. If you can help with that mystery, please do. Why it went there. And um, so these three farmer lots up to here were saved for the, or I'm sorry, up to the, right up to the gore. The three. That was the 600 acres saved by the planters for a town. Then you saw that, that one little square, and then all the little farms going out, which you can see here, right? All right, there's an Indian settlement uh, right here. There's an Indian settlement in Harrow. There's a lot of Indian settlements along that water. Why they need water, too. All right, but I, w I wanted to show the difference in the town planning. The guy who planned this in, uh, in 1842 was sucking up to his bosses in the uh, Ontario Parliament. All those MPs, because every road is named after an MP. All the streets in Colchester. I just mentioned Uncle Tom was there for seven years, and he wrote about it. There's a diary you can get. He wrote about being there and the problems he had. I want to show this, and I'm going to blow this one up too. Way up. You recognize this area? Right? you got Quentin Bay, you've got that, tower, that neat tower for Perry. What I want to show you here, again you can see the water, this is supposed to mark all the, uh, all the, all the X's for the sunken boats. It's not, it's not accurate, it just gives you an idea because you know they didn't make a perfect little square. What I want to show you though is this, Sheely Island. It's underwater now, actually there's a lighthouse that sort of sits on it underwater. It's there to protect the Colchester Reef. General Brock on his way to uh, come down to go to Amherstburg to fight those Americans at uh, Fort Detroit. Stopped there for a meal before they went around the corner. Alright, they had their uh, breakfast on uh, where Wheatley is today, which is on the Point Peely. People don't understand that. Wheatley's on Point Peely. Leamington's on Point Peely. Or I mean, like, on the point. Okay. Remember, the point goes like this, right? Okay, it goes till it meets over here. So you, he landed, he spent the night here. They had breakfast here. There, we've got a monument there in uh, Wheatley. And then... They came around here, had their next meal here, and then went around and met up with uh, met up with Elliot and uh, Tecumseh in the game. The other thing that's here in uh, that we had is every um, in the new settlement. Every June fourth, they had to, everybody in the settlement had to come to one area. Think in the Christian Bible about them going to Bethlehem because they had to have their yearly, or like their count. 
Same type of deal. Everybody had to be in the militia. They came to the town, the village of Colchester, and the land between the cemetery and the uh, and the ramp that goes down to the Colchester Harbor, that was the military training ground. So everybody had come, all the family, all the kids, they'd bring food with them for they have a grand picnic. And if they did census, it would have been a good time for the census because they would have had to do a roll call of all the daddies and kids that were old enough to be in the uh, military. So this one, uh, this one sort of shows them there practicing. And of course, all the whole family was cheering them on, and I'm sure it was more fun than actually marching, right? Okay. I just want to show this ravine picture. It's dry today. Remember, we had to dry all the marshes, which dried up many of these uh, streams or little creeks that went in. Yarner Town Line, Cedar Creek still does this. This one goes over here, and you go over it, go into the Arner. You can see it was a community. It had, the, it had the stores. What I wanted to point out is number seven was the, the original store, and number eight is where the store is today. It used to be across the road from there. Many people, they say they knew there was a store there, but they didn't know it was actually across the road. What I want to show you on here is this spot here. There's an 1813 fort there. The Indians, after they killed, after Tecumseh was killed at the Battle of the Thames, all the Indian tribes from all over shook a peace deal of hands and a peace deal with Harrison, General Harrison. They went home saying, there's, okay, we know we've lost. We won't be you know, as great as we thought we were. And they went home to live their life, normal life. All right, what happened later in the U.S. is what happened later in the U.S. That's different. The only one problem, the Anderton people, Tecumseh's crew, could not go home. Anderton wasn't safe. All those Americans, because we were American from the Battle of the Thames right through to July 1st of 1815, they would have just gone and wiped them all out. They had nowhere to go. Their home, Tippecanoe, Harrison already burned that. The Battle of Tippecanoe in, Ohio, in the Ohio area. And so they hid in the marshes of Cedar Creek. And remnants of the fort are still there today. So it's we're hoping to keep it protected, right? All right, there is friends of Cedar Creek and uh, Waggle Creek. I had them out there with canoes. The only way to get there is by canoe. It's on private land. There's only one problem. The guy who owns 24 doesn't own. This is actually a little off. Well, you know, I guess it's got it. It's on 24. The guy who's on 24 can't get to his property. Creek there, creek there. So it can't farm it. This guy here doesn't own the point. So he can't farm it. So it's been left alone. You can still see the fireplaces from when the Indians were there. And they, they left there in 1815 and went back to their Anderton Reserve. And the fireplaces are still there to be seen. The outline is still there. That, the fortification, we're trying to preserve that piece of land as much as we can. The town of Kingsville isn't interested at the moment. Uh, the only best way we can do it is through the friends of Wagle and Cedar Creek. And hopefully it'll stay fairly well. But remember the very first, or the slide I showed you, the black map? Well, you can get up Cedar Creek, canoe, it comes far enough, and it's canoeable, right through to almost the same piece of property that River Canard comes through. There's hardly a half a mile portage. That's nothing. If you've ever gone to Algonquin Park, some of those portages are a few miles. That is nothing in this flat land. Boom. That is absolutely nothing. So you can canoe from Cedar Island and come out of River Canard. That was the main, that was one of the big things about the Indians during 1812 being on that spot. Now no Americans are going to come up to the back door. Right? We're protected. We've got a way to get up there that the Americans probably don't even know about to get into that area. So it was a very important fort. I'm not here talking about 1812, but I'm talking about some of the unique features along our water. 
and what's there. And this was, uh, I put this one in, it's a very typical school. It's got that design, there's many of them around, built different ways. But a lot of times they did use the field stone to build their schools. That's what was there. They used what was handy. Think of the Mennonites who, and those who build their farm, have that barn raising in a day. Same kind of thing. They need the school. The, the locals would come, build the school out of whatever they had. And everything, of course, would be donated. There was no money. All right. We've talked a little bit about 1837. Um, I'm currently working on that, a book on that. But everything we do today was based on the results of that battle, Lord Durham's report. The school system, your law system, everything. All we've done since 1842 is tweak them a little bit. And that was the importance. That's more important than Confederation. And don't get me wrong, Confederation was important. But it, Confederation took a bunch of different governments and put them under one grouping because we had just had a civil war in the U.S., we had had 1837, we had 1812, we had 1776, all the Indian wars in between 1776 and 1812, and we had these Fenians come and attack as well. Man, we were tired of being attacked from America. So they said, you know what, if we get together and need one big government instead of a bunch of little ones, we'll do better. That's all Confederation was. Okay. Like I say, I don't want to say it was bad or good, but I'm saying it took a bunch of different groups, put them under one government, better able to repel the U.S. B.C. came in, well, we're way over there, what are you going to do for us? Well, they said they'd put a track, right? Train track out there. But again, we had to protect that as well. So I, I wanted to show that as a typical school. There's many of those buildings still out there if you go looking. Uh, New Salem's one. This one's gone. There's the uh, Albuna shop, or like the store before it got put down and across the road. The other one was actually, uh, I'm sorry, the Arner. The other one was actually the Arner School. Here's um, Oxford. Anybody here of Oxford? Where's Oxford? It's way up there in Ontario somewhere. Problem is, is we had two Oxfords, you can't have two Oxfords in the province. So Oxford got changed to Oxley. All those roads and all those streets are still there if you go looking. All right, what's neat, saw in Gristmill, they also had a foundry. The iron for the foundry came from that bog and harrow. They just trucked her down to Oxley. And it, it started becoming quite the town. It obviously faded a little bit. Today it's known for a couple of campgrounds that were hotels. The Ravine Cottages was a Ravine Hotel. If you look at the actual building, without a few additions that they put on it. The Retreat, there the Catholic Retreat, was a hotel. Okay, that was a busy spot. Two hotels. And they were fair-sized good hotels. The general store was run by the Bruners. It's closed today. Post office, those buildings are still there. It's still there, the post office. And of course, they also had tobacco, which is now a nice winery. But yeah, it was very, very busy. You can see where it tells you the roads go. Okay, remember this, we're on uh, Highway 18A or County Road 50. And yes, you would take that and up on the three and continue on to St. Thomas. All right. So it gives you an idea. The pier, I'll tell you, that's if you go down there, the end of that, if you go to the, uh, the winery's right here, right? Right in here. So if you go down to the winery and then pop down the end of the street, that's one heck of a path going down there. Like you're talking like this, and remember horses and buggies, right? and loads of uh, farmers' products. But that's one drop there. That uh, river creek thing's still there, you cross it. It's by the ravine, the ravine Hotel. 
or the uh, ravine uh, campground. I put this in, um, I didn't know who would be here, but this is a, this tombstone's still there today. It's a, one of the pioneers that came here. There's Fer Ferris Side Road and Colchester and that. This is, um, this one here, this sort of quite a story to this cemetery, is the um, Methodist Cemetery is behind the Anglican Church in Harrow. The Methodist Cemetery was there. They, or the Methodist Church. They sold the Methodist Church to the Anglicans when they opened the new, like now it's now United, now the new United Church. And then the Anglicans came and they sold the building, the church building, to another congregation. And then they built the, Angl the current Anglican Church on that site. The old church building is still there from the uh, mid-1800s and it's beside Naples Pizza on Victoria Street in, uh, not Victoria, on Erie Street in uh, Harrow, the white church. So anyways, yes, the uh, Anglican, the Methodist Cemetery is behind the Anglican Church because they sold them the, and that's where that is. Why well, put that in and uh, these next couple pictures, you may recognize some people here. The Hutchins Cemetery, that was Ruth. Anyway, in, a few years ago, the government was giving out plaques for 1812 war vets, and Ruth Hutchins actually got one that they put on the Hutchins Cemetery and one that went on Ferris's stone. You had to put them with the stone, and uh, they had a big uh, ceremony for that. This Hutchins one's well buried in the bush, which is somewhat protecting it, as long as we can keep the people with ATVs off it and keep going around and. It's a little open area, right? So they like going around making a mess. But uh, the town's helping look after it, which is good. It's a designated site. I put this one in. This one has a cornerstone that says 1867. It is an old Linda. It's the Whittle. The Whittles built this. The Whittles were one of the families that were a butler's ranger that came and settled in the new settlement on one of those farms. Now, all those farms were settled. You saw that. On my map, pretty much, if you followed it, those farms went all the way around the county, right? It only missed that mess of islands in Mercia. Or, I'm sorry, in uh, Malden Township. It, met, it left that it, because it was swamp. Even now, they're starting to build on the swamp. I don't know if those houses are going to sink or not, but they're putting them there. I'm not buying one. But anyways... The point is, what happened with them and many others? Toffelmeyer, Waggle, Dawson, who came in, uh, well, he, they came in 1803 to uh, Romney Township, the Dawson family. One brother stayed there, Joseph. The other brother, Thomas, met a Waggle, probably when they had to come and do their crops, because where'd they go? The Waggle Estate was where the mill was. And anyways, he married one of the daughters, and they set up in, uh, what, well, Ruth, and basically, where Calasantes is today, that was the Dawson farm. And so the Dawsons that you can trace back that far, the ones in Essex County are all part of Thomas, the ones in the Charing Cross area, and that area are all part of uh, Joseph's family. All right, they, they really, believe it or not, they really haven't intermixed that much over the years. There's not too much movement in those families to get them here. But I wanted to show that the, what I'm getting at with this, they're inland. They're in Olinda. Olinda's the first community. It was called the Back Community to start with. It didn't have a name. It was the first community built not on the water. And that's important. I did a whole book on it, but it's important. It's They're the first community. What happened? In, traditionally, and tradition oh, doesn't always happen, but traditionally the first son builds a second house on the farm. And you're allowed to have two houses on a farm for that reason. One for daddy and the parents, one for the usually, usually the oldest son stays and takes over the farm. The others get the boot to go find a new place. Well, the problem was all the transportation, like everybody's along the water, because we need that for transportation. 
I've got a stagecoach story. It took 13 hours to get from Windsor to Leamington. You know what? They can get, on boat, they can get from uh, Leamington into Windsor and back and do all their business in Windsor or Sandwich and back in less than that time. All right? So, yes, it was very important to have a waterfront. But where did all these second and third and fourth kids go? Some of them, White House had 11. Some of the families had 17. Common, though, common at the time. So what'd they do? Oh, Linda, it's on just, just, it used to be on Highway 3. Not the one you're thinking of. This house used to be on Highway 3. It's on, uh, it's on uh, Concession uh, 5. We're by the, that just down from the Medells have it today. It's a great place to get apples. It's just down, just uh, east of the uh, Universalist Church. Most people know it. They know it at all. They know that church. Just east of that, Medell Orchards, great apples. Anyways, why were they there? They're on the ridge, high and dry. Olinda is the highest piece of land in Essex County. You can see, you can all, from Olinda with a pair of, like, you can see Detroit, obviously. With a pair of binoculars, you're so high, you can actually see the cars on the road. It's that high. So it's the highest piece of land. All the Indian trails merged there. You had the one, the Ruscom, went from Ruscom down to uh, just uh, west of Leamington. I can't think of the name of the park. What's the name of the park? Stuff. You know the big park in Leamington? Seacliff. It went more there than it went into Leamington. Seacliff was its own community, right, until they had that amalgamation. And then from there they followed the one that went along the water into Oxley, the county, sort of the county road 51, into, uh, onto the point. Highway 3 went right by this house. All right. Somebody came along and said, well, gee, there's this big swamp. Remember, we're all underwater. We either go above the swamp or we go below the swamp. So if you look at the map of County Road 34, which is the old Highway 3 today, they chose to go under the swamp. In doing so, they make a big bend to go into Ruthven. And then when they did that, the town had to move to the bend. Otherwise, because they were bypassed, right? Think of old, think of Harold. Hiram Walker. Main source of transportation when you live in a swamp. Hiram Walker missed Colchester. Didn't go to Plot Lake on the Gore, right? The Gore and the Dunn, that's the second highest piece of land in Essex County. But, so the Harold, Plot Lake, had to move. It became called Munger's Corners and then Harold. Where they moved, they actually, believe it or not, moved into Hopetown. That was Hopetown. Parts of it. So anyway, you move because of transportation, right? And that's what happened here. Is the town had to move or it got bypassed? Because the street would have come out and almost, almost connected with the main entrance of Leisure Lake, Highway 3, if it had gone straight. What it did though is it actually didn't go to Ruthven at the time. It went on a, once it hit that bend, it actually went on a kitty corner right to Erie Street, that main interest and Talbot is where actually where there was, that road actually went that way. There's no sign of that angle road right now. We've only got one or two maps with it showing it. But I wanted to show you this. The kids had to move in. The widows are all over that area today. The, um, the kids had to move somewhere, high and dry. The Indian, it was already open because the Indians were there. There's two big Indian cemeteries there that are still there today. And they also, they became Olinda, which started a furnace. One third of the population of Essex County in the 1830s lived or worked in Olinda. That's where you had to build cart, uh, carts, you know, uh, carriages, wagons, all those were made there, a blacksmith shop, anything in iron. If you lived in Sault Ste. Marie, if you lived in what is now Chicago, you needed one of those big plots that you see around. 
You had to get it from Olinda, or you could carry it up to Niagara Escarpment if you wish. Has anybody gone to uh, Brock's Monument and seen that little path that goes down to, down to uh, Queenston? You want to carry one of them up that sucker? If you do, let, let me know and I don't want to watch you. Okay? You don't want to do that. We supplied everybody from Olinda on the upper lakes. I sort of say we because I'm tied to the Wago family and all of that. This is the Toffelmeyer house. Uh, Jacob Toffelmeyer, one of the original sons of Martin. He built the house there. He, had, uh, he was actually pretty honored. He was in the War of 1812 and 37. And um, he, uh, he built that house right across from Leisure Lake. The town of Kingsville decided they didn't need a house to, from uh, 1812 before that, so it disappeared. His son got 200 acres, and his house is still there. It is now the front room of the big house. That tells you the size of this thing. All those bricks, the Linda General Store, there's a couple houses there from the Fox family. This house, uh, his son Jacob's, they were all made from clay by hand on the Fox farm. But they were all the, they were all the kids. Okay, Dawson's, I told you, they got the, the farm we're called Santias. They had the whole 200 acre farm. That was deeded to Christopher Waggle, kid number 11, 11th of uh, the Waggles. And he, as a wedding gift to his niece, not even his daughter, his niece, who married Thomas Dawson, he gave him that 200 piece, uh, acres of land. And that house came down about uh, 25 years ago, the log house that they built. But this one, I, at least I got in there and got pictures. Okay, here's one of the Chippewa Indian. Uh, this is on Big Mike's Fox. This is property. Um, it, um, those, Nichols, Nichols owned that property today, his farm. They came over during the war. They got a job as farm hands right after the war. They got a job as farm hands for the Fox family. And when the Fox family moved out, Around the 1960s time period, they bought the Fox Farm. Back you'll see along County Road 18. I want to show you uh, this. They had in Olinda, they had two towns, uh, two uh, like residential areas, not two towns, but two residential areas. One for miners, the miners that mine the ore. One for the uh, the people that put the ore in product and probably uh, like and the um, the people that went out in the bush, cut the trees, did all the other jobs, they had to, they lived in one of them. But they had one, one for the mining town was just across the mine, for the miners was across the mine. The other one was uh, on what is now the Medell farm, where I showed you the uh, Whittle, the Whittle house. Oh, by the way, the Whittle house, the Whittle family cemetery is now Graceland that goes with the Universalist Church. They donated it. This just gives you an idea of what was there. I can show you where this road was, and the farmers don't like it so much because they keep hitting the foundations of these places. I mean, the foundation was only the log, right? But it's still there, and they keep hitting them, so they don't like that with their plows. That's the furnace that was there. The Ruscom River, by the way, starts on the Whaley Farm just across the road on, con on Concession 5. Then it goes through, uh, it used to be the Bruner place. Like I say, now it's... Uh, that Whittle's house, it goes through there. And they had this on the Ruskin River, and then of course it empties into Lake St. Clair. There's a different view of it. I'm not here talking about Olinda, but it is where our early settlers went. And that's what I say, you've got to know their stories. Uh, somebody drew this up for the uh, tours of Windsor. I always say that's Jacob there. Well, Toffel Myers were one of the people that owned and ran the furnace. There's one of those big pots. There's what all the stuff they put in there to uh, melt down the uh, iron. This is a poor picture, but it's the best I can find. The iron would have come in liquid into like a heat, think of yeast troughs, down troughs, and then they went down these little ones and then off into the little bowls on the side. These ones are making pig iron. A farmer along the way somewhere the farmers help off season and when they're not needed on the farm, remember those second kids still needed jobs. Well, 
This was supposed to be mother. They said, hey, that looks like mama pig. This is supposed to be mom with all her little teeth there. And then all the little pigs clinging on. Pig iron. Okay? If you, if you lived on a farm, maybe you can imagine what I said there. But that's where the name came from. They had to uh, make charcoal. That would hold enough. They had to have seven of those because it took seven days to uh, make charcoal. They basically used the whole thing of charcoal a day. The charcoal, where one of those sat right here, and you can see the dark land from the charcoal. That goes down at least 12 feet of charcoal. They haven't made charcoal there since at least 1837. And there's still a good 12 foot thick of charcoal on that site. And uh, I, I, it's black and white because I need it for the book. I'm not even sure if I have the color one anymore, but you can see the difference. It shows up better here than it does in color, actually. But it's a it's a 50 foot circle, and it goes down at least 12 feet of solid charcoal. So if you want some charcoal from 1837, you can get it there. There's another way to do it if you didn't do the brick thing. You covered it in uh, basically you covered it in dirt leaves. Uh, here they would have used uh, clay. We don't know which method they had here whether they use this or with clay covering or whether they use the uh, building, we have no idea. This is a lime kiln. You, you need to take our limestone, make it a powder like you have for the baseball diamonds. And they did have one of these. And uh, the, again, the foundation's still there. We know exactly where it is today. We'll leave it a little bit buried. This one here is unique. We got some new information on this. But all this leads, again, the kids of all these new settlers. This is what I'm talking about, the stories. All right? We know these names. Big deal. What did they do? Well, these kids, Waggle, Bruner, um, well, Dawson was a little later, but uh, Toffelmeyer. Toffelmeyer, of the 18 200-acre farms, Toffelmeyer has owned about uh, 10 of them. Uh, James Gurdy had 400 acres and slaves in uh, Olinda. He's the only one we know there that actually had slaves. I want to show this because we got some brand new information on that. Forget this, this should be brick. This is a very typical 1940s blacksmith shop. You can see that all over Ontario. Blacksmith shop. Has everybody been into a blacksmith shop? They have in the Pioneer Villages all over. Nice third floor because they know they make a mess. They can just clean it up. There's a difference with this building. It has a basement. It was built with a basement sometime in the 1830s, around 1840 time period. And what we, we could never figure it out. Because a black, what do you want? You don't want a hard floor on a blacksmith shop because of the mess. You want dirt. That's why everybody had dirt. What was different here? The minister they hired that the Bruners hired for the Baptist church. The Baptist church was the shrine of Olinda. Nobody dare come and interrupt their Baptist church. Huge. They even had a fight because the guy who owned the land the church was on, Mr. Bruner, his daughter played, was learned to play the violin and he wanted to play it in the church. No, 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 no music in the Baptist church. Couldn't do that. Well, he whined and cried. He owned the land. Everything, the whole town was on his land. They never did sell the land. They kept the land. It was a, it was a mining town, right? You keep the land. You build houses for the workers. Harm Walker did that too. He owned them all. And then he started selling them off later. But anyways, he had, he had convinced this Baptist minister to come from Ohio to be to minister here. And of course, he married one of Mr. George Bruner's daughters. Naturally, their house is still there. How was their house built? And one of George Bruner's sons built Reuben. They took clay. We got lots of that, don't we? Probably off the Fox Farm because that's where they were making the bricks at. We had oxen. His oxen have big feet, and horses have little feet. They don't go through the mud so much. Oxen will also cross over logs with a horse and walk at it. And we had plenty of straw, we still do today. They actually had the oxen stomp 
the straw into the clay, made the bricks, and these bricks are like 18 inches long and foot deep and or a foot foot thick, and I think they were six inches high. They weigh a lot. They weigh a lot, and they built a house, two houses like that. Man, they'll, they'll go nowhere. <laughs> okay? But anyways, this one was built in the back of one of those, at the back of one of those houses. On the street at the time. It was on Baptist Street, Baptist Road, because the Baptist Church was the next intersection. Anyways, the minister, his family in Ohio, were told, we haven't proved this yet. I only found out two weeks ago. So I haven't had time to prove this. Their family was were conductors on the Underground Railroad. So when he came here, just him came, one kid out of the family, the story goes that he continued that here. Why now would he have a blacksmith shop with a basement in the back of his the back of his house? Maybe. We don't know. Alright? Because I haven't had time to research it, but that's a story. And that was from a family member. You know how you hand the stories down? I found that family stories, and please listen to them, family stories are usually right. The Indians pass the stories, like their stories down forever. The Bible has passed down stuff. Okay? The family stories are usually right. What you have to do as a researcher and a genealogist is take that family story and bring the fish back to the right size. Okay? I'm sure you've all done that, right? You'd say something and, and it'd go around in a circle and by the time it got to the end, you're lucky if there's three words that were the same as the start, right? Same sort of deal. But listen to those family stories because they're usually correct. All you have to do is start, okay, now I've got the tip. You take that tip, you go somewhere here like the History Center upstairs that they just did, which is fantastic, or wherever, your genealogy society or all your friends on Facebook that are part of OGS, and say, look, I got this story. Can you help me get the fish back to the proper size? I did that a lot. That's how I got most of my information. I got the tip, and then I found the documents that supported it. But at least I knew what I was looking for. Before that, without that family story, I wouldn't have known anything about it. So I just received this family story a couple of weeks ago. What I've done is I've made copies of the letter I got and gave it out to the people in Olinda and they can talk and see if it's part of their family story. And they've had two weeks to look at it, now I have to go back and see what they found out, and then, of course, do some research myself. So we may or may not have, again, it was inland, off the water. The Graham Side Road, they had to get from Olinda, no roads, right? There was no Highway 3, it was just an Indian path. They had to get from there to the water. What they do, they built a road called the Graham Side Road. The Graham Side Road went from, only went from Olinda down to Daddy's Dock. Everybody has kids, right? But, Dad, can I use a car? Can I borrow a car, Dad, huh? Right? That's how they get around nowadays, right? Or can I have five bucks for the bus or whatever? Well, they were, they were landlocked. Hey, Dad, can I borrow your dock? So Dad said, sure. They built a road. Probably no more than a goat path. Mr. Weigel had lot six on the uh, eastern division. Mr. Fox had lot seven. The two families were friends. They built the road right to Daddy's dock. The two dads had one dock. Better to build one instead of two, right? When you're living side by side. They built a nice dock. And it grew up to be Albertville. Once you had a dock, you're bringing stuff down, you need the warehouse. The post office was called Gosfield. It was in Albertville. There was no Kingsville, there was no Ruthven, there was no Leamington. They weren't even thought of. Okay? And, anyways, and Leamington was Wilkinson Corners at that time. But that's how the Graham Side Road got built. Why is it crooked? It had to go on the property lines winding around. And all those properties were wiggled around where Carl Santes is, with the exception of the one that Mr. Dawson had that was away, were all rooters. That nice big beautiful house there by Carl Santes was built for, uh, for Reverend Henry Bruner. But anyways, that's what's unique about that building, but we don't know for sure. It's only a family story. 
So keep your eyes out and let me know. Iron ore, raw ore. And you can, again, you can see the iron in the farmer's field. This one here is not in the south, it's in Sandwich. Anybody go by that house? Anybody, you know, it's, as you leave Sandwich going towards uh, LaSalle? Yeah, I've seen that, I just don't remember. Yeah, Reverend Pollard's house. So that's a, that's a few years old. Okay, his, his original tombstone is now in uh, the uh, Colchester uh, Anglican Church Cemetery. And they put a new one on this spot in uh, Sandwich Town. And they gave the Saint old John one to Cemetery. them. Pardon? St. John Cemetery. Yes. They put a new one there and they gave the old one to uh, Colchester. Callum McGregor House. First uh, newspaper in the area was printed in that building, and then there was a couple of black people, people of color, uh, newspapers printed then. Harriet Tubman had one, and she disagreed with the way the bibs. The bibs thought it was you had to teach people what to do when they got here, which they did. You know, when the color, when the people of color, the fugitive slaves came, well, when's the dinner bell for supper? They'd never been like they 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 could get land. Well, I told you where they lived on the on the in uh, Colchester. Well, that's fine. I'm here. Well, how do I get food? Where do I get clothes? They didn't know anything, right? It wasn't they were stupid. They were in new land, just like when immigrants come today. We gotta help them out. So the Bibs believe they should help them and teach them how to farm. You know, some of the farming things for this area as opposed to the farming they did in the south. They built houses, they got land, they built houses. They actually cleared probably 80% of the bush in Essex County, but they had to be taught these things, what to do when they got here. They knew how to farm, but you had to show them, well, where, okay, now where can I farm? Where can I get a, build a house? They need to be taught all that. Harriet Tubman had different ideas. And the two, believe it or not, two different newspapers for the people of color out of the same house. And so, as you know, she left and she went to Chatham and Niagara on the Lake and St. Catharines and around up in that area. They just couldn't, the two found, the two different people just had totally different views. I'd be like putting a liberal conservative or <laughs> today Trump and Clayton in the same building. It wouldn't work so well. But uh, McGregor, who was there, John McGregor, built a flowering mill in uh, Chatham. The creek became known as McGregor's Creek. And there, that's the pile, part of the pylons from the uh, mill in Chatham. They're still there today. That guy there, I don't know, anybody know if they're related to Simon Gertie? It's a nice picture of him. Think of Daniel Boone would look the same at that time period. These guys live in the bush. You know, no neat haircuts for them, no top hats, none of that stuff. Simon Gertie would look, or I mean, Daniel Boone would look much the same. They were the bitter enemies. The, both, both those gentlemen led the armies to attack each other. They were each captured a couple times themselves. But I'm not getting into their story, but they again were one of the founding families along the bottom of the county. He's got a few brothers. They had land in the new settlement. They had land in Aurelia, or Olinda, I'm sorry. They had land in Amherstburg, Malden Township. His tombstone's on uh, County Road 8, 8, County Road 20, as you uh, south of uh, Amherstburg. It's moved, so it's read out by the roads. You don't have to go on private property. That's a whole nother story. But he's our Daniel Boone. He's our hero. Without him, we probably would be American. No doubt about it. They also claim he's the founder of Sandwich. I'm not sure. The only ties he had to Sandwich besides the Sandwich was the capital of the area. It was the capital of what they called the Western District, which included uh, Essex County, Kent County, and Lambton County. Any government things you had to do, whether it's jail, land registry, whatever, even if you're all the way up in Sarnia or Grand Bend, you had to come all the way down to Sandwich to do your government business. Remember, you came by water because there was no way you came by any goat path. Within a month or two by goat path. Okay? 
But uh, he was also the last person to uh, leave Fort Detroit when they had to hand it over to the Americans. And he jumped in the water on his horse. The current took him downstream. And he came out sandwiched. And maybe that's why he's the bomber sandwich. It's the only connection he'd have that way. I don't even, I couldn't even find where he actually owned land in Sandwich Town. There's his tombstone there. It's not the greatest picture, but it gives you an idea. And it's uh, shaped a little bit like a tree. There's a reason for that. Now, I like having fun a little bit at times. We've got to we gotta laugh about our ancestors sometimes. This is an American version of uh, Gertie. <laughs> All right. Here's another American version. Of course, he's the uh, guy being at the back, right? Being uh, attacked by a Daniel Boone type person. Okay. The thing, they didn't know what, they only, there's another, look at him there, right? Look at there, what do you think? Is that our hero? Like I say, you gotta, you gotta go with the times. They had some fun with them. Why not? It was their enemy, right? Okay, this is David Gurry, my cousin. I, I, want, I showed this on purpose. Uh, they had a, re, a family reunion. Simon Gurdy's mother got remarried. The Indians killed her, the husband, the father of these children. And she got remarried to a Turner. That Turner's family's still in Ohio. And so they're, they celebrate that they're part of the Gurdy family, which they are. And they had a big reunion. David's dad went down. I know David was working, and I found out too late to, go to get time off. But they gave out these shirts. That's sort of a neat little thing on them. What I want to show you is this, and I know this is bad. I couldn't get a good picture of it. Let's see if I can blow it up a little bit. Okay, let's see what we can do. Gurdy, this is the back of the shirts. Gurdy Brothers, Extermination Services, serving the Ohio Valley area since 1777, specializing in Frontier white trash removal. <laughs> well, you had one of them tied to the state, right? Okay. Uh, hemp burning. Hemp was used for the ropes and that, right? The different form. Uh, for, that one says uh, fort, basically it says fort burning or station burning. If they're forts, they call it stations. All right. Killing of livestock, captive taking, and killing and looting. This is what they did. I'm going to have to probably increase this a bit. I don't know if I'm seeing it better or not. Probably see it better. Anyways, references available on request or just ask the boys of Blue, Lit, Blue Licks, the big battle of Blue Licks. Uh, reasonable rates, and they will match any other competition. And we welcome, we welcome all, is it all trade? All trades, oh, all trades for services, and of course, they're, they're, uh, we fill, we kill to fulfill, is their uh, line there. So, we, you know, it's fun, sometimes you got to have a little bit of fun, eh? This is uh, somebody's version of Albertville, it would look real good if it was in England and not here. Albertville and both Union, both the docks at Union and Albertville were just straight. There was no cold. But hey, somebody had a little bit of fun at tourism in Windsor. I think it looks cute. It just didn't happen. <laughs> this is the Weigel Cemetery. It used to be on Lot 6 in Albertville. If it was there today, it would be underwater. The cliffs eroded back. And it got moved before it went under water. It got moved in uh, for 1925, and it's now in the uh, it's Green Hill Cemetery in uh, Kingsville. You go in, you get in a, about a, oh, a couple hundred feet. You'll see it's on your uh, left hand side. You just take the road. You take the you go the road in. You take the first left and the first left, and it's there. And this is where all the waggles are, and many of the people from Albertville are in this area. Um, Gertie, Simon Gertie, you saw his, his is in Amherstburg. His son, Simon Peter Gertie, ran and owned the mill in uh, Albertville. He went by Peter because it was so da dangerous to have the name Simon, which was his first name. He's buried there down by the bush. We don't want any Gerties to serve in the rest of the cemetery. They might come up and attack, I guess. I don't know. But it's right on the edge of the cliffy roads a little bit. Gone. You have to go looking for it in the bush. But Simon Peter Gertie did a lot of good. Billy Caldwell. 
I'm going to take a minute and talk. He's another one of our famous people. Again, Caldwell, his, his dad, got a lot, did a lot of the treaties for our area with the Indians. He, most of Merce, well, most of Malden Township, he got from the Indians. The bottom part of Colchester, Kingsville, Leamington, all that area of the new settlement, Peely Island. They, they got that, and then they were issued chunks of it, depending on their service to the British military and the, and the king. Well, Billy was, uh, was from his first family, the, the first marriage, he's half Indian. He's actually the founder of Chicago. And uh, they won't tell you that when you go there. In Chicago, they got a sign. When we got rid of those Indians, we uh, built our town. There's still a piece of land in Chicago under Billy Caldwell's name. The only person who can get that out of Billy Caldwell's name is the President of the United States. Nobody else. So it's still sitting empty in the middle of Chicago. It's got to be worth a fortune in the middle of Chicago. But he had it all, right? And it's all down to a little bit left, like 100 or 200 acres or something in the middle of Chicago. The only person that can release that for any kind of development is the President of the United States. And it hasn't been done yet. Another one, Split Lock, Chief Split Lock. They settled in the Anderton Reserve. And uh, his son, Matthews, started a railroad. He became the first North American millionaire. There he is. He became the first North American millionaire in Native Indian, the son of Chief Splitlaw that fought at the Battle of the Thames and with us and Gertie through all their battles. He's, uh, his Chief Splitlaw is buried in uh, Anderton. This is another famous person from this area. And this is Sally Ames. She's, as far as we know, she's the only female fur trader. She owned all the land one mile off the Thames River from Lighthouse Cove all the way up to the forks in Chatham. She owned all that. Of course, the British government didn't like that because they were the, you know, those family compact people. She had more money than all the family compact together, but so they picked on her and didn't allow her to have it. She's buried in Amherstburg at the uh, original Roman Catholic Church Cemetery. The Roman Catholics, when they moved their church and built the big new one, they plowed under their old cemetery. And she and many, many famous Essex County people are buried in that cemetery, which is now under housing development because that's what the church did. They did it themselves. That's what's important to remember. Nobody bought it and did it. They did it. They bulldozed their cemetery when they built that new church that's there today. But anyway, Sally Ames, Sally Ames' house, about, this is dated about 1780, this house, still there today. A gentleman, the family lived in it up until the, into the 1970s. There's no hydro in that house, there's no washrooms. There's the inside of the house. This family, they, they, the family has lived in it that long. Right up to the into the 1970s. This is the inside today. They didn't decorate it. This is the way it was left when they, this is the way it was when they still own the house. They're just not living on it. They actually built a nice house. If you didn't call this one nice, but anyways, you can see the way it looks. I brought pictures on purpose for this group. The chances of getting it in that house are almost never. All right, they don't allow a lot of people in. I was lucky. I got in. So I took lots of pictures while I could. <laughs> Typical log house. She had slaves, so you know who built it. <clears throat> All right. Imagine that, living in there with your family in the 1970s. It is moved back from the water, otherwise again it would be gone. Another thing we built all over the place, this Klondike was one of our small communities. A guy had gone in the gold rush, came back and said, hey, Look at our gold, all the wheat. Look like gold. They named the community Klondike, and they named, named another one, uh, Yukon, just up to... So we've got a lot, of, this is a typical school, you can see them all over the place. Some of them are buried in houses. What's neat about the church in New California is they made the bricks, the families did, 
and they wrote their names and their bricks. You, that is a place, if you go to New California, it's the McCain side road and, and road two in Leamington, or in uh, Kingsville. Go there, please probably take, like park in the parking lot, take a look, what would you want to see? You might even have a relative there. I know some of those are mine. That, like my grand, you know, the, my grandmother's era, late 1800s, early 1900s. They had a place, uh, just, uh, this is uh, Brooklyn, or Broad, Broadwell's Corners. It's uh, Division Road at number four. They had another cute name for uh, that corner. Okay, here's a, an old uh, log cabin that used to be at, uh, still on uh, Division at uh, number three. Uh, row 3. New Canaan store, black community. Again, we put them in the bush. If you go along there in the spring, you'll see all the houses or little islands. As the, because the water in the, the creek there, the river's filled up. New Canaan's on the Gasco side road, and it's between Walker Road and County Road uh, 15, on like number 12, the Gasco Road. Alright, Salem School's still there today. You had Salem is on the, um, like the Leamington side of the division. This is New Salem. Black Salem is on the Colchester side of the division. All on, kind of, on, all on Road 3. Okay, they had uh, the other main industry that started all these, all their little towns was the sawmills. Camp Palmer is still there today, just about in its entirety, owned by one person. It was a sawmill like a logging town. There it is there. Almost all that's still there today, all owned by one person. Okay, there's the uh, superintendent's house, which is owned, it's across the road. Here's another one, another sawmill town. Edgar, Edgar Mills, on the Southern Railroad, the hotel's still there, the store's still there, the store's still there, the school's still there. The, this road here used to be here, right here. When the county made the road, they moved it over a thousand feet. This is called King Street. This is uh, County Road 15 today. You can go there today. All right, there's a store. I just mentioned it. Woodmen of the world is uh, like the foresters. They took care of you from the day you were born until you were deaf, dead. Remember, we didn't have social services. And you'll see their main thing, one of their main things was making sure everybody was buried with a tombstone. A lot of them are just a pile of rocks or a wooden cross or whatever. And you'll see Simon Gerdes is that way, right? Looks like a tree. You see the tree? Well, Simon Peter Gerdy had theirs, and he used, because he had money, he used his benefits to put Simon's tombstone up. See him? So if you see a log, that's probably got a hatchet in it. If you see any like that, that's because they were members of Woodman's, Woodsman of the World Insurance Company out of Omaha. They're still operating, so you can Google them. And like I say, they're like the foresters that we have here, many of the other insurance companies. From the day you were born till the day you died, they took care of you. If you were sick, they paid your benefits, and they still do today. This one also, when you're buried, they'll pay for the tombstone. And of course, we've had this already. Please go out to the Can uh, Canadian Transportation Museum in Heritage Village. Many of the buildings and places we talked about are out there. We'll let the general stores there for one. And I am doing the, uh, the talks out there, and that's it. But I thank you. We have so much going on in county, on the southern part of our county. I mentioned the Dunn Road. I mentioned the Gore. I'd like to remind you that the library will be closing in 30 minutes. The, um, that Gore Road, not Erie that goes from Harrow to Colchester, the Gore that, or the Dunn that branches off and goes down. That is the old road to come in. Erie Road was not there. That is one of the most historic roads in Ontario today. Everything that ever happened in Ontario up to at least 1900 happened on that road. It only goes a couple miles. It goes about three kilometers. So that was very, very important. Every hundred feet, some major event in Ontario's life happened on that road. So if you ever get a chance, go for a tour. If you don't know my books, if it says tour, they're self-guided driving tours. 
if you're not familiar with my books, okay? But anyways, I thank you for listening and putting up with my talk. I hope you learned a little bit. It was a lot of bits and pieces, but the new settlement filled the interior on the southern part, the little county road eight. Those kids, that children of, had to settle somewhere. Yes? Uh, I'm just wondering if you know where North Ridge was. Yes, I do. It's yes. still there on Highway 3. There's a beautiful, famous ice cream shop everybody goes to, and it is east of Essex Center on Highway 3. I'm doing some research for uh, a woman in Ottawa, and her ancestors had Lot 7 and Lot 8 in the village of North Ridge. Correct. But I don't, I have no idea what concession that would be, and the land office says I have to have a concession. Yeah, yeah, don't, don't start it, don't, the land office is great, but please don't start there. Go to a historic society up here, if you're in Windsor up here, can help you. Heirs, the Marsh Collection. What you need is an 1881 Atlas of Essex County, Essex and Kent County. They do have copies here. Like I say, again, uh, there's even, in, even, even in Essex Center, Eckers is there in the old Carnegie Library. They can help you. But it's on Highway 3, and they probably, they may have had, if they said they were in North Ridge, they may not have had a farm. They may actually have had a town lot. But it will tell you that on that map. Okay? It's a very common map to find. It's very easy to find. Just don't go to the land offices until you get that exact thing, the historic place, the history centers can help you get there. All right? And this group you're in is fantastic helpers <laughs> as well. They're good sources, each and every one of them. Okay? But if you're in Windsor, just visit up here. See Tom up in their history center here. He'll get you that lot number. You want that historic atlas of Essex Kent, 1881. All right? And it's in Gosfield. I was, I was just up there a few minutes ago, and there's a wonderful lady up there who's very knowledgeable. She helped me with my issue right upstairs, right above us. Yeah. Miss so, Go upstairs, big room room blast on the floor. Go talk. She's got it all. Chris, on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for a tremendous amount of information. I don't think any of us knew the extent to which, uh, you know, Essex County, particularly the southern part, had that an impact on where we are today. So. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Well, thank you. And remember, children of the seven have to thank.